Welcome to Decolonization in Action. My name is Edna Bonom, and the guest for today is Dr. Shakanitsa Mapongo, Associate Professor of Science, Technology, and Society at Massachusetts Institute for Technology, author of three books, The Mobile Workshop, What Do Science, Technology, and Innovation Mean from Africa, and Transient Workspaces, Technologies of Everyday Innovation in Zimbabwe. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. I want to begin about the African continent and colonialism, as well as what brought you to your research. Your work cuts across at the intersections of history, science, theory, and technology studies. You've written about organic vehicles and guerrilla healthcare. How did you come to research this topic, and what specificities do the African continent have in technology studies? Um, the first thing that I will say is that uh, Africa is often accounted for as an absence. Uh, or a kind of victim of circumstances beyond its control. And uh, when people go to Africa, scholars in particular, what they are looking for is very good uh, data, basically. Uh, empirical uh, fodder for Western theory. And I think it's not the way that uh, you want to approach Africa. It's as if Africa does not have intellectual input on anything. What we really need is kind of study that takes seriously Africa as generative of ideas. In other words, repositioning Africans as intellectual agents without necessarily having to uh, burden what they think and what they do uh, with uh, these overlays of Kant, Immanuel Kant, uh, Derrida, or Foucault. I just think that those uh, people know Europe well, there is no doubt. But with all due respect, they most of them, if not, you know, the majority of them, have never been to Africa at all. And we seem to think that their uh, perspective is a, a general view, and it turns out that they are either just writing about France or Germany or the United States. That kind of uh, universalism is imperialistic. So my work is dedicated towards recognizing this Africa in the long uh, on its own trajectory of thought and practice uh, into which Europeans insert themselves, particularly by dint of slavery and colonialism. And that encounter becomes a phase in the trajectory, but in no way the trajectory of Africa. Because, believe it or not, Africans surmount slavery, they surmount colonialism. If you can separate what is <laughs> colonialism and what is slavery, ordinary people really talk about colonialism. They don't talk about colonialism. They talk about that moment as a moment of slavery, captivity, theft which they then expand and pretty much continue with their trajectory, like every other peoples on earth. And I want that process to be really fully accounted for as a process of thought, a process of deliberation, self-determined. So that's what I, what I try to do with my work. Thank you for elaborating on Africa as a continent, as a place that is not only driven by extracting information, data, or perhaps resources, but one in which people can think about their own knowledge production. It reminds me of an article by Mahmoud Mandani, the African University and the London Review of Books, where he describes what an African university looks like with respect to knowledge that's a bit more diffuse, knowledge that and philosophical traditions that come from the continent. Can you speak to the ways in which history of science is coded in the knowledge production of the African continent more broadly, one that isn't just Eurocentric? Now, let's understand that I have problems with the project of the history of science. I have problems with the history of technology. I have problems with the framing of innovation now, in part because it is coming from a very specific cosmology a different, very specific way of looking. Now, that is different from saying I'm anti-science, which I'm not. I'm a strong believer in science, 
I just think that it has to be more democratic, more multiple. You see, a lot of what we now uh, hold dear as scientific fact was produced in laboratories where only white males were could access. Black people were not there. Every person of color couldn't be there. Women couldn't be there. And so diversity is not just cliche. Diversity is not just about including the numbers so that we can continue to partake too in uh, the same kind of knowledge production driven by that very specific, exclusive, even reclusive cosmology. Diversity for me means inclusion in indeed, as well as modes of thought that order that kind of knowledge production, by which I mean that the greatest a gift that diversity brings, whether to a class or a conversation or to making things, is that you are focused on one uh, particular task, but each and every one of us is welcome to bring how they think, how they see things. All of us together, without some referee who is standing with a big stick and say, get out, you don't, that, that's not what we do here. Uh, get out. That's not the kind of thought that we... Unfortunately, the 21st century may not be the right place for uh, knowledge tyrants who police the boundaries, precisely because it's now becoming more like an innovation century where it's not so much the disciplines in their rigidity that would insist on the form or content of what uh, becomes a technology effect. This is something that we need to really think with, the impact of access to information by a broad constituency on the planet essentially means that that monopoly of knowledge and ways of ordering it is at best a 20th century uh, idea. What is now critical is for us to revisit conceptions of, in my view, three things. What do we mean by science? In which case we have to put on sale the question of the scientific. Given that what has been canonized as the Western canon, or as science, core science, was a long process of translation. Translation of Chinese knowledge into Western knowledge. Translation of Arabic ideas into Western ideas. Translation of Egyptian ideas into Roman ideas, into Greek ideas, into Islamic ideas, into the Western canon. Direct translations of, uh, you know, African ideas too, straight through colonialism and slavery into Western knowledge. So <laughs> at that point, it becomes rather silly to imagine that there is one part of the world that produces knowledge. Every other part of the world produces uh, fantasy and fiction. That's the scientific. The technological, too, is now very tricky. What do you do when a lot of the things we see in Africa that gets canonized or anointed as technology are produced in everyday life? What I call everyday innovation when sometimes the technological has nothing to do with human making at all, in the sense of an artifact that did not exist in any shape or form, that the human hand and mind uh, synthesizes out of multiple raw materials and turns into a gadget or an artifact. That's not the, the kind of technology I mean because it's too limited the reduction of the technological to gadget. What I mean is something more substantial where you can be technological without touching the environment, particularly negatively, which is the kind of what I call strategic deployments, which I hinted in my uh, mobile workshop. The idea that you can insert yourself into the environment, 
in strategic ways that transform, say, a mountain into a fortress against enemies. The idea that you don't have to kill your way to a disease-free environment, an environment free of fly or mosquitoes, but can strategically choose to position yourself in the environment in ways that do no harm, whether to these insects or to yourself. The, the technological is no longer that simple. It's now about how we don't modify at all, which in this age of concern with uh, climate change is a critical issue. The third thing relates to innovation, which is now primed around machine learning, artificial intelligence, vis-a-vis -vis human intelligence. And the argument about the auto apocalypse seems to be that, you know, algorithms, bots are taking over our lives, which is a myth from Africa because I have never seen throughout African history any technological vertigo that dominates decisively people's lives. Instead, we have seen from time to time human now, human ingenuity, creative resilience persistently come to the fore. And the colonial moment is telling things that were used to colonize Africans and subdue them for tens of years would be the very same ones that Africans would pick up and expunge the colonizer with. Q guns, Bibles, the mobile phone which was not mobile on its way to Africa, but was rendered mobile by Africans, by African mobilities. And the result was m -Pesa. And the result was Please Call Me. And many other things. So this, when the story gets told, it's as if how mobile technology is changing Africa. Nothing could be further from the truth. So my point is that what matters for us and should matter for us is people who come from Africa or have African roots, is a knowledge that is useful to us, a knowledge seen through us and not simply us as some kind of objects and subjects of study, which the last century was about. So in many ways, you're asking us to trouble knowledge production, but not just knowledge production, what we understand as to be as part of science, technology, and innovation. And you alluded to this long durée of translation of knowledge that was coming from South Asia, from Western Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, Arab Islamic science, and people like Mar el Shakri has written about this, Gian Prakash and Another Reason, uh, George Saliba has written about the translations that have happened in the Middle Ages by Arab scholars around medicine, etc. This knowledge is rich and, and, and heaps of people have done this work, but I think one important thing that you're bringing up is that that there is a continuation of information being translated, being entangled, being synchronized, one could say, and that it offers a space, uh, particularly in the post-colonial context, where something like a cell phone is a form of technology that is being used, modified, and adopted by people on the African continent. And so one's job as a historian could be to deepen what we consider to be scientific objects and how people are using them today. I want to push back on the idea of the post-colonial. I don't believe in it. I don't think it's useful. Indian scholars will use it. It should end in the Indian Ocean and die somewhere before it begins to make landfall to Africa. We never use that term very much. In fact, when the conversation was, the conversation about the subaltern was taking place at a, the same time as the concept of invention was, was being rigorously debated in Africa. Terence Ranger is a, a, a spin-off from the Hobsbawm book, uh, The Invention of Tradition. And more rigorously, uh, Mudimbe's uh, idea of Africa, invention of Africa, and others. And the conversation revolved around a critique of the colonial library. And those scholars left it at the idea of colonial library that is the basis for writing in African history, the archive, and as, as a stricture to how far we can excavate the African voice. And my problem with Mudimbe's formulation was precisely that 
how are we really sure that this is a colonial library? After all, I am not even sure that it is a colonial compilation. At best, it is the pending of a colonial name, a European name, to an archiving that was done by Africans. Who was producing the knowledge? Was it this a guru who was a, a, the, the, who called himself author, or was it an African, often called an assistant, interlocuting with African intellectuals that were simply rubber stamped as informants? So we have a very archaic language here, which we need to ensure we no longer teach our students as a way of trying now to bring in new vocabularies. I have not had conversations about African knowledge as science. The view being that science is too hallowed. It follows very specific procedures. Well, who specifies them? When was the United Nations General Assembly uh, decision made by this assembly of scientists who were impartially brought into this room uh, on the basis of their complete intellect, on the basis of merit, no prejudices, no gender prejudices, no race, racial prejudices, prejudices, just a very wonderful room populated by people who merited being there. So the pitch that science occupies is one which is privileged by historical injustice. And a minority view that then decides what gets said or discussed. I wanted to move to a point where we have a far more democratic uh, conversation around having the Western canon on the, on the one hand, but also other canons that can come to participate in what gets defined as the history of science. I'm not convinced that the conversation has got there yet. There's still so much defensiveness. I don't know why. So in many ways, what you're describing is that labor or knowledge, particularly in what would have been a colonial context, may not always recognize an African worker who was producing, documenting, perhaps even exchanging information about what was going on, and that we need to dig deep in terms of the looking at archives to see who's actually doing the documentation, who's actually doing the collection, or even the categorization. This brings me to the, a question about one of your books, where you have a chapter on guided mobility and you use this term chave or genius to describe a person who is engaged in skilled work, someone who's actively embedded in the practice of trial and error and discovering. So this is from your book, Transient Spaces. Can you tell me a little bit more about how this conception of genius differs from how genius might be perceived from Western Europe or North America? You don't know without others. Number one, you only know within not even a collective but a community it's what we call the communality of knowledge this was the major difference between a, a african socialism and marx very well articulated by leopold seda Senghor. he was saying communality of purpose yes collectivism no Precisely because Africans start from the communal, going to the individual who is implicated within the greater health of the communal. Whereas Western scholarship, Western theory often starts from the individual who, for one reason or other, including insecurity, collectivizes. So there is a very big difference there. And to the extent that there is that difference, we have to note knowledge is a communal process. The embodiment of that is the concept of nimbe and intima, which is a collective work party. When you have a widow, the underprivileged of society, an elderly widow, an orphan, you don't just leave them like that to their own devices. In times of plowing, Everybody gathers for a work day. Everybody brings what they can. They make a big feast. They brew beer. And they till that entire land and plant crops for these vulnerable of society. 
They do the same when it's time for weeding. They do the same if they want to construct a house, etc., etc., etc. And the way it's done is such that there is music that is pacing the rhythms of hoeing and, and digging and so forth. After the uh, work is done, people then uh, open up in merriment and celebrate the day. We are talking about the realm of the communal as a kind of everyday. The realm of Shave is critical because it invokes the spiritual. Hence the question, what is the connection between the spiritual and the technological in the African context? A subject which we elaborate on in the edited volume. What do science, technology, and innovation mean from Africa? Precisely because we need to be sure that we do not get distracted by the conversations in Western uh, circles around creationism on the one hand and science on the other. That's none of our business. Religion to us acts as a kind of inspiration, deep faith. If you have a prayer and you believe this operation is going to be successful, because you are not alone in this task, there is a communality between the spiritual and the personal flesh that's at work in what you're doing. You get motivated at the very least, which invokes the concept of African modes of psychology. What psychology do you require to go into this? Uh, feeling. And Shave is a spirit of uh, expertise, which the Shangani Goshi TV, it's called so many uh, uh, names across Africa. There is a word for it. And it's deep, deep expertise and perfection, which goes beyond just the skill and application. So those conversations around skill and so on and so on, they are too narrow for me. They don't accommodate these complexities. So in many ways, what you're describing is a kind of push against universalisms, a push against maybe the Enlightenment project that was anti-clerical or projected itself in some cases as anti-religion, but that there could be other epistemologies, ones that somehow marry spirits, spirituality with knowledge production or spirituality with uh, innovation some ways, this kind of relates to um, my next question, which is the role and the place of troubling laboratory or spaces in which uh, science can be produced or ideas of knowledge production and innovation can be produced that may not fall neatly into a laboratory uh, at a university, but rather in the forests, in a crop, in conservation spaces where people are experimenting, adjusting to, or um, creating new methods from scratch in the outside world, not just merely in uh, an enclosed, perhaps what can often be read as a sterile space. And th this is something that you uh, in your work have looked at, the, the kind of the outside world or laboratories that are part of that everyday environment in the context of Zimbabwe. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate on how... Um, laboratories or outdoor laboratories is why that's important for your research and for expanding our notions of knowledge production uh, on the African continent. Let's be clear that the idea of laboratory as building comes from a very specific tradition of the enclosure system in Europe where you have enclosure not just in terms of uh, fences make good neighbors, and therefore it becomes a private activity. But also, I'm thinking of a different kind of enclosure based on systems of taboo in the African context, which protected intellectual property and in five minutes be privy to the deepest knowledge secrets of a society. This is precisely why Africans needed a kind of scary, scariness, a, a veil of scariness to a, a access to their most important knowledge. For men, you could not get to 
a, a place where people are making uh, steel or turning uh, ore into iron. If you were a woman, that was an enclosed space. Similarly, for a, a, a women, no men could go to a place where they were making pots. Extreme forms of taboo were prescribed to ensure that nobody really got there. Now, and so on the one hand, we have an enclosure that was intended to exclude everybody from getting in. On the other hand, you have a laboratory, you know, a space where you could make pots. Wasn't always, first of all, it was not indoors. Whether you're making iron or you're making a, a, a pot, did not necessarily need to be even indoors. It was the same with making bed lime, which we grew up doing. You didn't even need to be uh, in-house. It could be at the source of a, 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 the rubber tree, for example, at the place where you got the clay or right near where you got the ore. Hence the idea of a transient workspace. A, a workspace. It could be lifted to be anywhere. It could be mobile, right? So it's very different from a canonization of a technology derived from scientific rigor, so-called, which is a two-stage process. You innovated in the African context through doing, through performing the work. In the Western system, it's the same in, in, in the engineering as it is with design. You have to have all these designs nicely laid, laid out uh, in through stages. African forms of design don't operate that way. You have to go and take all the facts from out, the material data from out and bring them in and shut the door. What are you exclosing? and enclosing. So these kinds of systems cannot be simply lifted into Africa and be expected to perform miracles. It's precisely why the built laboratory is in Africa barring one or two instances to do with uh, a military R&D are perfectly useless. Point me to, to any that have actually produced things that have uplifted Africa. So we need to reimagine in a continent where the majority of the economy is resident in the informal economy, you cannot tell me that the, uh, the big sign, so-called R&D, should be the driver. That's a wish. There is a reason why people resort to informal means. It's because the formal has not been very useful. And that's why we have to open up the notion of lab laboratory. What does it mean? What should it not mean? Who cares what somebody says it should mean? Who are they to us? There's simply nobody. And out of that kind of a, a anarchy on the concept, we are able to reconceptualize these things in ways that make sense to us as Africans. So in some ways, the anarchy or the reimagining, reshuffling the place of the laboratory is also more inclusive of, of women in the way that the question around a kitchen can be a space of experimentation. A kitchen can be a space in which certain forms of knowledge, uh, particularly around herbal remedies, uh, one could say alchemical practices are being done. And that allows a space for more Black women, more African women to be included. And we see some of this appearing in the works of, for example, Abena, who has written a work, a work on bitter roots. Um, yes. And that text uh, goes to show the um, enslaved and also African knowledge, how it gets used and now, but gets profitable for certain pharmaceutical companies. And that is where the, the tradition is lost. It's important to capture that precisely because. The Western model of both feminism and, you know, inclusivity resides in a having, it doesn't matter which space, a shared space, male and female, 
that supposed to reflect values of equality, however defined. In the African context, what we see are very interesting developments. Women who are realizing that, wait a minute, our grandmothers were the pharmacists of the family. They were the energy managers of the family. It's a question, it's not about winning bread. The concept of a breadwinner is utterly useless if you go deeper into African cosmologies. Why? Because the woman was the manager of the family granary and its security. She knew when the stocks were low precisely because we men here were not allowed to enter the granary in Zimbabwe traditions. We were not allowed to enter the... It is the woman who made the granaries. We men, we only made the uh, the base of the of 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 the granary the the burn house we put the heavy stones there we put the heavy uh, poles there and then we laid the structure as in uh, vertical poles and made sure that we tie them together the job of finishing off the construction in well the other thing we did was we thatched that was it the flooring was done by women. The walling interior, exterior was done by women. The partitioning into which granary for which crop, uh, when it would be opened, because these were sealed, women. And they were the managers of a, something that I'm working on now, the food chemistry. How would you ensure that you prevented weevils, for example, and other critters from getting in uh, to eat up the grain. And one way you would do that is you would first have to fire this before the thatching, fire the interior of the, of the granary to sterilize it. And then you, 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 you make sure that the whole interior is completely devoid of, of, of uh, moisture. Right, with the thatching being complete, you then put all the grain in and sealed the, 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 the entrance to that uh, particular partition. Completely sealed. Nothing survives in, an, in, a, in that vacuum. It's completely uh, isolated of any of this space. That was women's knowledge. Now, and my point is this. The reason why I, I, I go to great lengths to try and uh, excavate this knowledge is this is a scientific enterprise that women ought to benefit from because the intellectual property produced was produced by none other than them. You can extend this to African ceramics, which have many applications now. But do you know what's happening? The big industries now are swooping in under the guise of promoting, you know, emancipating women in Africa and cashing in big time on the profits of that IP. So that's um, very interesting that you're talking about how aspects of domestic labor and particularly collective labor uh, can be read as scientific. Yeah. And it very much is reliant upon uh, the experimentation and the innovation of women. Now I want to turn to uh, questions around decolonization, or rather, can you elaborate on the differences between decolonial, decoloniality, and decolonization, especially with respect to something you pushed against uh, earlier, which is the post-colonial, and not yeah. using that term. Um, and so if we think about the African continent and being the kind of site in which colonization, European colonization happened, and not, we're here currently in Berlin where the partition of uh, the African mm. continent happened, how do we understand um, Africa as in, in a kind of post, not post-colonial, but after the decolonial movements? Um, mm. is, is colonialism still alive today? And if not, um, what are people doing to challenge uh, the colonial processes that occurred in the 19th century 
And how do people rid themselves with the kind of vestiges of that today? Mm. First, let's, I, I, when I write about Africa, I always want to make sure that uh, um, at the end of the day, young Africans and people who mean well for Africa, uh, towards Africa, are, are not depressed. That's very important, which is not oblivious of history. I want, as you may know, when I talk about dehumanization as thingification following Cizé and Fanon, uh, I, I want to make sure that we understand the beasts, the many dragons that have confronted Africa, which we have slain. So I do not bother myself too much with histories of forces that are beyond my control or might appear to be beyond my control. Now, this is why I, I, I have a problem with anything that still reinscribes the notion of colonial as a framing reference for writing about Africa. As Mamdani once said in a famous speech at Cape Town, University of Cape Town, it's passe to continue to write Africa is pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial. Who were we before the pre? And as Mamdani accurately said in that in that speech, it's pre it's an it's a proxy for saying before the white man came, while the white man was here, when the white man left. Now, it let's not put lipstick on a frog here. It's still a frog. It doesn't matter what kind of decolonial, even non-colonial. It's not enough because by the uh, 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 move of refusing, purporting to be resisting, you are actually running towards the colonial, except that you are using a different alley. Can't we account for Africa in a longer trajectory of self-determined progression through history? And so for me, the question would be, of what use would that be? For one, I want to write a history that in which I not only recognize myself, but my children will recognize that they come from people who have faced possibly the worst that human civilization or uncivilization has ever uh, 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 you know, brought on anybody else. 400 years of slavery, 400 years of your best energy and intellect exported, deliberately uprooted from Africa as blacksmiths, the best of their time, as masons, eh? as rice growers, as people whose uh, uh, reproduction and production would nourish Africa, exported. And when they are there, they turn their slave quarters into innovation hubs. And we appear like innovation hubs are 21st century stuff. So the danger that I see is that we risk if we don't, I think for me, the idea of slavery, the notion of slavery is what I see a lot. People in Zimbabwe, for example, they were not talking about colonialism. And I do this, I show this in a preface to, my, to the mobile workshop. I never had, my dad never had the word colonialism or colonial being used by ordinary people. The words they were, that were being used a uh, Translate to abductors, rapists, slavers, grabbers of our land, eh? grabbers, abductors of our wealth. These are the concepts that they were using in their own native language. Colonialism is not translatable. 
Where are we getting it? Whose experience are we writing when we reference it? Where are we writing from? For whom? Africa. So these are the consciences that we have to be aware of. And otherwise, we will write an intellectual history. Fun to read, changes nothing. For me, as a scholar, I think that it's fair to say that we academics have been complicit in the continuation of the colonization of the continent. Because we don't write narratives that, in that project, where, where was it sidetracked? When Ranger was writing in 78, he invoked the notion of usable pass. Very much in vogue at the time because we were engaged in liberation struggles in Africa. A moment in which Africans were using the experiential location, if you read A Dying Colonialism, Franz Fanon, you will see that the experiential space was a space where theory was mobilized in service of problem solving. Then in the 80s, Ranger gets sidetracked, and Ranger was influential at this time, gets sidetracked by this notion of the invention of tradition. And people go agog about the invention of tradition. Hey, was this an invention? Was this what? what? Then it gets hijacked by post-structuralism. And we were firmly on a very tunneled, narrow academic trajectory. Good to hear in the lecture theaters, but completely useless as operationalizable knowledge in transforming Africa. Now, I'm not saying that every historian or anthropologist has got, is interested in uh, 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 doing something about Africa. Most just want to study it. Fair enough. But what about those of us who are Africans? And even for those that write about Africa, what, was, what about the conscience that you go, you get your informants, that horrible word, they help you, uh, and research assistants who are actually the ones doing the research, to help you write a wonderful book. You get your dissertation after writing a good dissertation. You publish. You get tenure track. You get tenured. Meanwhile, the realities that you witnessed are either unchanged or getting worse. What is the moral ethics of African studies? What should it be? Just studying because Africa is fascinating? No, there's nothing fascinating about Africa. Forget it. One thing that I, I guess I appreciate from what this last comment is, is bringing up is that we should be sober about the terms we use, about the histories and calling the people by the names in which they were from the people who might have been infected, impacted by major historical um, traumas, major historical traumas that was disrupted the African continent on a large scale. And, and so one thing that I appreciated from what you just said and, um, earlier is just writing histories or writing um, histories that include people like you or the voices of, of people like you that could then be also read and understood by your lineage or people in, 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 in your family. So I guess I wanted to um, ask one last question is, what role do you think imagination has in uh, challenging some of these historical uh, traumas, um, past uh, partitions um, and just the the massive uh, uh, enforced uh, migration of enslaved people. Um, how can we think about and reimagine new histories, new futures? One way to think about it is to think that the for Africa, I don't know, Africa has the, if not even more of the power that Europe had during the colonial moment, the global omnipresence. Hmm? We are everywhere, under rocks, in, in the snow, uh, probably in space. 
everywhere. The litmus test for us is that is to realize that this is a good thing for us. Secondly, we are soon if we don't already have the youngest population in the world, which is another factor for African presence. Increasingly, people are now talking of, of global Africa. And that in some instances, countries are beginning to think of designating seats for their diaspora population. And so at the same time, whereas Europe uh, colonized Africa at a time when you would need months for weeks and months for the ship to get there with the mail or newspapers, you do that in many seconds. Now, if you combine these at a time we are also having infrastructure that is networking Africa internally, or be it connected to the Belt and Rail Initiative that China is, is engaged in, the question then becomes, what kind of African studies do we need? Not just to study this moment. I'm tired of that. I'm an African and I am seized with making sure that we pioneer a new kind of humanities. And for me, that new kind of humanities is dedicated not just towards public service, but towards problem solving. Humanities, social science, and the arts in service of problem solving in our time. We cannot afford this generation to simply be good students of the past. Or, or, or anthropology and do good anthropology. That was nice for the last century. It can do for the present. Not least because, to finish, the automation that is now here may actually see off most of the jobs that were created by that mindset anyway. The 21st century student must of necessity be somebody who believes in a communality of knowledge production, recognizing the strengths that they have from their training in view of a larger collect a, 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 a communal. How that happens for us is the most important strategic partnership uh, decision of our time. Thank you so much for this engaging conversation and taking time to talk about such an important topic. Hey, this is Alex Head, founder of Subtext Radio. This is Subtext. Please go ahead and click the like button and the subscribe button. It really helps us to reach new audiences and promote the artists that we work with. Hit like and hit subscribe.